Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, you're, on, you're watching Fuel Yourself at Fabulous.tv with Sabrina Khan. And I've got a wonderful guest with me today, Heather Van Boros, and I'm so excited to have Heather on. But uh, before we go into our interview and discussion, just a little bit more about why I set up this platform and a bit about me. Well, I set up this platform because I want to be at the forefront of the health and wellness uh, revolution for women and um, through that process revive the way they eat, move, think and live because I do think we're living in an era where disease, dis-ease is at an all-time high, uh, chronic obesity is an all-time high and I'm a very, very big believer in um, food as medicine. Um, you know, clean eating, vitality from food and lifestyle style, and really sort of healing yourself uh, with food and lifestyle changes. And I myself, through clean eating and through my own experiences, not only managed to control my IBS, which is why I'm so passionate about the whole thing, but also reduced my cholesterol, lost weight and kept it off, warned off diabetes, which is a big thing in Asian of families and also in my family and also got over a cancer scare and I've got so many people around me that have healed lots and lots of different symptoms from cancer to diabetes through clean eating and through diet through lifestyle so I just feel that there's a need to get this information out and uh, my whole focus in the next couple of months and for the last few months has been on the area of gut health digestive health with the special emphasis on IBS because even though I was only diagnosed with it last year I've had it for over 20 years so it's an area that's very dear to me and through visiting my own doctor and um, specialist I just realized that there was and talking to other people I just realized that there were so many people out there that were dealing with the same problems and um, you know very often the medical profession don't actually know how to help you or, or 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 where or really where you should go so um so yeah that that's why this is this is an area of particular interest but this is a live show um you can towards the end of the show you can leave your questions on the right at the bottom of the page and Heather will answer your questions, but yeah, Heather Van Boris, I mean, the list of your achievements just goes on and on, Heather, so that's why I'm so excited to have you on. Um, you're the founder of Heather's Tummy Care, um, best-selling author of Eating for IBS. Uh, you've got a website as well and an information page, Help for IBS. So, um, yep, Heather, um, just tell me a bit about yourself and um, where this whole journey started from. Sure. <laughs> um, technically, you could say it started when I was nine years old, uh, when I suddenly had my first IBS attack, out of the blue, with no warning, uh, with really no family history, no, to this day, explainable cause for why it was suddenly hit me. I was a happy, healthy little kid. It was summer vacation. I was playing in a neighbor's backyard. It was a beautiful day. And um, all of a sudden, I just had the most indescribable abdominal pain and I thought I was going to die and the world went black and I couldn't see and I fell to the ground and I eventually just blacked out from the pain for I'm not really sure how long to this day a couple minutes maybe and I was trying to call for help for the, the woman who lived in the house the neighbor lady and I couldn't get her name out I couldn't even whisper it and um, I really I don't know how long I lay there in her carrot garden <laughs> eventually it passed I was very cold and I was very sweaty and very shaky and I have no idea what had just happened to me. So I got up and dusted the dirt off my clothes and I went home and told my parents and I looked fine and normal at that point. I had recovered and um, they took me in to see the doctor and the pediatrician didn't really run any tests at all and she just pretty much dismissed me that there was nothing wrong, um, didn't really care that it was indescribable pain, didn't think it was worth looking into, and that just repeated itself for quite a few years after that. I kept being taken back to the doctor every time I would have another attack, 
And she eventually, you know, ran very minimal tests. I found out years later she didn't do any of the tests that she really should have at that point. And I wasn't offered any help at all. Um, her exact words to me were that it's just pain and I should quit whining. So I did. And I just lived with it for the next 10 years, eventually realizing that it probably wasn't going to kill me, but it felt like it was. And I needed to figure this out for myself. Even if I didn't know what was going wrong, I really needed to figure out ways to stop the problem, to find out what was causing these attacks. And I did it really just for me for those first 10 years and figured out what I could eat and what I couldn't eat and just continued to live with it. And it was really another 10 years past that point when I was 29 that I ended up on the internet when it was brand new and stumbled into these sort of chat rooms with a lot of other people who had irritable bowel syndrome and thought, you know, that's eventually what I was diagnosed with. And my God, I'm not the only person in the world with this problem. It was just, it was shocking to realize that. And it was equally shocking to realize that all of these other people were where I had been when I was nine years old. They had no idea what was going wrong and they didn't know how to help it. They didn't know how to stop these attacks. They didn't know how to keep themselves stable. And I just started talking to people and sharing information that had helped me. I don't know if it will help you. I hope it does. Here's what I can eat. Here's what I can't eat. Here's what I've learned over the years will help and what will hurt. And things really just snowballed from that point on into books and then into products that were known to be helpful for IBS, but people couldn't find. They weren't really on the market in the US. And it ended up becoming an entire company. And as you said, a website and a patient support organization. And it's just ended up taking over my life <laughs> in ways that I never would have anticipated when I was in the fourth grade. No, phenomenal. Personal to me. <laughs> But you seem to have a very severe attack. I mean, people with IBS have different levels of symptoms. That's correct, yeah? Absolutely. Um, the sort of definition is that it's lower abdominal pain or discomfort in association with bowel dysfunction. So it can be diarrhea, it can be constipation, it can alternate back and forth. Um, and the degree of pain, as you say, it varies tremendously. And I am on the extreme end, um, but I'm not alone. That I've heard from a number of other people over the years who have just as severe attacks as I do. They end up in the emergency room, they've been given morphine. I have talked to women who have said that the natural childbirth was a walk in the park compared to an IBS attack. One woman had triplets, I will never forget her telling me that. <laughs> triplets was just a breeze compared to an IBS attack. And then I've talked to people who are concerned that they don't really have IBS because they hear how severe the pain can be and that doesn't describe them. They just have some more minor pain or even just more discomfort. So there is definitely a spectrum of severity, absolutely. So what is the official definition of IBS? Because we were discussing this before, there's lots of uh, theories, there's lots of different um, yeah, definitions flying around, but what's the official definition of IBS? Uh, the official definition is that it is a brain-gut dysfunction. So as a syndrome, um, it's a collection of symptoms. It's not a disease, it's a disorder. And it's a disorder in which the enteric nervous system of the gut, which your gut has its own nervous system, it doesn't function right. And it also doesn't communicate properly with the brain. So it is literally defined as a brain-gut dysfunction. There is no evidence of underlying disease. There is no evidence of inflammation, of any kind of infection, of structural abnormalities. It is really a collection of symptoms, and the symptoms are defined by the Rome 3 criteria for an IBS diagnosis. So it's important that people don't try to self-diagnose IBS. No. And it isn't so much that you can't manage it on your own as it is that there's a number of other diseases and disorders that can cause symptoms almost identical to IBS. And that can range from inflammatory bowel disease to celiac, which is an autoimmune disorder that causes gluten intolerance, to a bowel obstruction, endometriosis, colon cancer. There is just a great big long list of problems that can cause the same symptoms. So you really need to see a GI doctor and they will basically exclude everything that could mimic IBS. And if they can successfully rule out everything else 
and if your symptoms fit the ROM3 criteria for diagnosis, that is when you end up with a diagnosis of IBS. Agreed. I mean, I myself underwent all the tests last year, colonoscopy, endoscopy, and at the end of I mean, it was a relief in, you know, it was a relief because obviously the more severe symptoms um, were ruled out. So, so what is IBS not? Because that's the other thing we were just discussing beforehand. A lot of people say, even, even um, specialist GI doctors, you know, I've been reading a book recently. Um, I mean, some people say that it's parasites or candida, uh, but so what's your de what what's your view on this, Heather? Well, that's really not within the medical definition of it at all. And if something like parasites are discovered, or inflammation is discovered, some structural abnormality is discovered, that should preclude a diagnosis of IBS because now you've found a different source for the symptoms, and those can be treated. So if someone is diagnosed with intestinal parasites, they should be treated for that. That's not IBS. Someone is determined to have inflammatory bowel disease or celiac or colon cancer. They will be treated for these things. They're not IBS. There is no evidence of candida overgrowth in IBS at all, and they've looked. They've been looking since the 70s, and it's not there. So it's really a dysfunction of the nervous system of the gut. You can certainly have IBS and other GI issues. That's actually not uncommon. In fact, anything that is an insult to the gut, such as abdominal surgery, inflammatory bowel disease, um, sometimes pregnancy, anything that severely upsets the normal function of your gut, food poisoning, can actually lead to the development of IBS. Yeah. And you then recover from the insults. You recover from surgery, you get over the food poisoning, but the nervous system of your gut never really fully goes back to normal. And now it's not functioning properly, and you're left with IBS. So people can have more than one thing going on, but I think that it's wildly inaccurate to say that IBS is parasites, is candida. It's not. You're talking apples and oranges. Yeah, I mean, from from uh, from my own research and from my own thoughts, because IBS is kind of um, a sort. It's like a generic set of symptoms, and a lot of, you know, a lot of other things can cause the same symptoms. People generally give it anything that's undiagnosed as something more serious, it's labeled IBS. That's right, and that's another big problem. You know, I've even heard some doctors describe this and disparagingly, they're not in support of this, but it's kind of a garbage can diagnosis where if you have these mysterious GI symptoms and they can't figure out what's wrong with you, they just dump you in the garbage can that's called IBS. Yeah. And that's really not, not accurate. Your symptoms have to fit the rope through criteria. It has to be lower abdominal pain or discomfort. It has to be in association with bowel dysfunction. If you just have nonstop diarrhea, that's not IBS. If you have nonstop abdominal pain with no diarrhea or constipation, that's not IBS. Um, upper GI issues, you know, chronic nausea and vomiting, these are big red flags for other disorders. It's not to say that you can't be nauseous with IBS, but you can't just have undiagnosable GI symptoms, therefore it's IBS. That's really not fair to the patient and it's not an accurate diagnosis. You need to have a collection of symptoms that fit the diagnostic criteria. And if you don't fit the diagnostic criteria, you need to keep asking questions of your doctor and ask why they are diagnosing you with this when you don't fit the diagnosis. Maybe there are other tests that need to at. Maybe they need to look more at your family history. Are there any other red flag symptoms? Do you have joint pain? Do you have skin problems? Are you running a fever? These are all things that would point to something else going on causing GI symptoms, but much more, um, there's much more of an underlying pathology there than there would be with IBS. IBS would never cause those non-GI symptoms. Yeah, other things that I know IBS would not cause is sort of uh, bleeding uh, and also vomiting so so your advice is just keep pushing if your diagnosis does not fit the ROM3 criteria of diagnosis for IBS just keep going back to your doctor and just keep pushing for more tests and for them to yes. point you in the right direction 
I would, and I know that's it's very hard for people to hear, and I, I really empathize having gone through a living hell with doctors myself with diagnosis. It's really the last thing that you feel like doing. But um, I think a lot of times people, they just know. They know that this isn't making sense. This isn't really explaining their symptoms. They have a bad feeling about it. Those are the people who really need to push for an alternate explanation. You know, they've ruled out everything else in your family history and your age. Nothing is coming up as a red flag. And maybe you have severe IBS and severe pain, and sometimes you vomit from the pain. That can be within the rubric. You, you just don't want these standalone symptoms that really aren't explained by IBS. And as you said, you certainly don't want something like bleeding. Yes. You do not want to be running a fever. That, that's just a, a huge red flag that there is something else going on there. Um, women need to look at uh, OBGYN appointments as well because endometriosis and ovarian cancer can cause IBS symptoms. So it's, it's not necessarily fun or easy to get a diagnosis. Um, it, it depends a lot on the person. If your symptoms really fall within the wrong criteria, you otherwise are under age 40 is about the cutoff, there's no scary family history, then you don't necessarily need to keep pushing for more tests. Mm -hmm. But if your symptoms really aren't fitting, if the onset happens over age 40 with no explanation, if you do have a family history of celiac or colon cancer, um, autoimmune disorders, these are all instances where you, you need to push and make sure that they really have excluded other disorders and that it is just IBS, for lack of a better word. Uh, so once you've uh, got your final diagnosis of IBS, is there actually a cure for IBS, um, Heather, in your opinion? That's great. Not that they know of. Not that they know of. Um, the closest thing that they may have is gut-directed hypnotherapy, yes. which is like gut-specific hypnotherapy. Yes. And that really should be the frontline treatment. For a lot of people and unfortunately it's still used as a last resort um, despite a lot of leading GI physicians urging that it be used as a first resort. It is the only thing that seems to physically change the underlying pathology of IBS. They don't actually know how it works but they do know from clinical studies over decades at this point that it does work. It somehow physically changes the way the enteric nervous system of the gut works, the way that it communicates with the brain and it either lessens or it completely resolves all symptoms. And in at least one study where they have tracked people for five years, their symptoms haven't come back. So that is the closest thing they have come up to that you could possibly call a cure. I don't think that's a completely fair definition, um, but it is something that for some people does seem to really resolve symptoms and keep them at bay for at least a very lengthy period of time, if not forever. Yeah, gut-related hypnotherapy uh, in my area where I am in the UK, one of the specialist IBS um, researchers, Dr. Warwell, yes. he's really look into the, looking into that area very, yes. very heavily, and, and that is the IBS treatment that he suggests as well. Exactly. He's, he's just got decades of clinical studies. Dr. Warwell has been fantastic in this area. Um, we have a bit of a counterpart, Dr. Paulson, at the UNC in the U.S. has been doing a lot of hypnotherapy research. I think the UK is ahead of the U.S. in this and that you have really integrated it into the GI practices. And yes. what I hear a lot of GI practices will have hypnotherapists on staff to treat their IBS patients. And um, I wish that we had that in the U.S. We don't. It's still sort of thought of as a little bit you know, out there as a treatment. And I, I don't know of any GI centers ex except for the research facilities like UNC where they would have a hypnotherapist on staff. So it's a bit of a struggle to get that information out to people yes. through their primary care doctors, through their regular gastroenterologists. Um, and to emphasize, it's not just general hypnotherapy. It is gut-specific or gut-directed hypnotherapy. It's quite specific to IBS. And there are at-home programs. If people can't find a local practitioner in the U.S. if it's not covered by their health insurance, there's programs they can listen to at home that are an option for some people. Some people can't leave their homes. They are literally housebound by IBS and hypnotherapy as an at-home program because it's really the last resort for them. So, so something that is more accessible to people is how they eat, is what they put into their body, which um, 
I've been doing a lot of research on doing a course on as well. And obviously you've written books about it, eating for IBS, which I know is a huge uh, seller. And they're actually carrying out some research based on your theories in the book as well, correct? Yeah, yeah, there was a doctor in Canada, interestingly. Um, it's been nice to see dietary research has really come a long ways with IBS over the yes. past 10 or 15 years, which is wonderful because it used to just be like banging your head against a wall. They weren't looking into it. There were a handful of studies, but people weren't really doing the sort of broad scale dietary specific research for IBS. And now that they've started doing that, we're finally getting some really good studies and really good results. And it's something that I think patients have been just clamoring for for a very long period of time. So it's nice to see that come to the forefront. It's really about time. So, but what's your sort of theories around um, eating for IBS? Because I know it's not just what you eat, it's how to eat it and it's how to put it into your body and it, it's all really fascinating. So do you want to go into some of some of that? Yeah. And, and I know insoluble and soluble fiber plays a big part in your overall work for eating for IBS. Yeah, it does, it does. Um, yeah, it's, I think that eating for IBS, it, involves both restrictions for people but also a great degree of freedom because it's it's not necessarily a black and white issue for most people no. there are degrees to maybe how much of a certain food you can tolerate or how you're eating it how it's cooked and prepared can play into how much you can tolerate so in general because by definition with ibs your gut is hyper reactive it doesn't react normally to normal stimuli. It overreacts sometimes to really nothing at all. Sometimes to putting anything in your stomach, as simple as a glass of water for some people can trigger IBS attacks. Non-food issues like just stress or hot, humid weather, all of these things affect your gut. And in IBS, they affect your gut in a way that can trigger these severe symptoms. So I think the goal when you are eating for IBS is to do everything you can to keep your gut calm and stable and to sort of gently force it into normal rhythmic contractions mm -hmm. to try to keep those contractions of your bowel from going awry. So you really want to be careful with GI stimulants and GI irritants and you want to focus on your GI safe foods that really encourage normal motility in the bowel. And a sort of cheat sheet version of that would be your GI stimulants are fats. All fats, whether you have IBS or not, these rules will apply. All fats are GI stimulants. They really increase the speed of the contractions of your bowel. So anything that's high in fat is quite likely to be an IBS trigger. Yes. It doesn't really matter what kind of fat. It can be extra virgin olive oil, it can be lard. To your gut, it's still a GI stimulant. Obviously to your heart, the rest of your body, your overall health, you really want to focus on heart healthy plant oils fish oils choosing olive oil over lard for your general health but you still are going to have to probably minimize the quantity deep fried foods are just really too high in fat for people with IBS. Um, red meats are very high in fat dairy tends to be high in fat egg yolks all of these things are either difficult or just impossible for most people with IBS to manage so you don't go fat free but Going low fat can make a big difference. Yeah. GI irritants such as coffee or alcohol, tobacco is actually a GI irritant. Artificial sweeteners and things like soda pop, these can really upset the normal rhythm contractions of your gut. So if you can reduce them or eliminate them, that's going to take a, a big problem out of the arena of your diet. Then you've got sort of I call those the red light foods. Like those are like the stop. Stop, don't eat that. Just don't eat the red meat. Don't eat the dairy. Avoid the soda pop. Don't drink coffee. Nobody wants to hear this, <laughs> but, but it's true. And your health may depend on it. So if you can just take those trigger foods out of the equation, you'll have a big head start. And then you have sort of the yellow light caution foods, which are primarily insoluble fibers. And insoluble fiber is what most people think of when they think of fiber. They think of bran and raw leafy greens and roughage, kernel corn, that type of thing. The hulls, the skin, the seeds on fruits and vegetables. That's all not just fiber, it's actually insoluble fiber. 
And that literally means that the fiber doesn't dissolve in water. It is insoluble. So insoluble fibers are a very powerful GI stimulant. This is why a lot of those types of foods are recommended for people who have traditional constipation. They will act as laxatives. If you have IBS and you don't have a normal gut, these normal GI stimulants from the insoluble fibers can trigger all kinds of IBS symptoms. So unlike the high fat and GI irritant triggers, you can't just eliminate insoluble fiber foods. You would be wiping out every plant food that there is and you know, have some serious malnutrition. It would be a very unhealthy diet. So this is where it gets into how you eat, making quite a big difference. Anything that you can do to reduce the insoluble fiber on these foods. So take the peeling off of fruits and vegetables. Take the seeds out. Just simply chopping things up or throwing them in a blender mechanically breaks down the insoluble fiber before you even eat it. It's still there. You're not extracting it, but it is being broken down before you even eat it. Chewing it thoroughly can actually make a big difference. Um, cooking those kinds of foods makes a big difference. If you think of the difference between a handful of raw vegetables or fruit versus cooked, you could literally see how much the insoluble fiber has been broken down. Yes. It sounds almost silly, but it makes a big difference to your gut. If you can do anything you can to minimize the effects of the insoluble fiber on your gut, you'll be able to tolerate a lot more of those foods which you need for good health. So that's a bit of a gray area. How much insoluble fiber can you eat? What kind can you tolerate? Maybe have it cooked instead of raw, um, and then maybe have it with or after soluble fiber foods, which is your other category of fiber. And that's the category that most people don't realize is fiber at all. So things that people often think of as starches, rice, noodles, oatmeal, pastas, bananas, root vegetables like potatoes, things you think of as starchy, those are actually quite high in soluble fiber. And soluble fiber dissolves in water, and it's a, I think it's really the, the magic key for IBS and for using your diet to, to force your gut to behave normally. Because soluble fiber does that, whether you have IBS or not. Soluble fiber regulates the motility of the bowel. It just forces it into normal rhythmic contractions, it stabilizes the peristalsis that goes awry if you have IBS. And it also regulates water content in the bowel. So whether you have diarrhea or constipation, soluble fiber just takes you to a nice stable middle point and it keeps you there. So if you can make soluble fiber a foundation of your diet, of your meals, of your snacks, if you use that as a foundation to add in the insoluble fiber, you can keep your gut running smoothly and running normally. It's a bit of an odd concept for people at first, but once they learn the difference between soluble and insoluble and how to eat around those guidelines and not just what to eat, it can really make a world of difference. And you can not just avoid the foods that will cause problems, but you can actively focus on eating the foods that will minimize or eliminate the problems. And that's very helpful. Because the other thing is actually, uh, like you said, keeping your digestive... Um, tracked healthy at all times and working correctly so eating little and often throughout the day which is, which is another belief i'm a total believer on that because eating that way did change my gut health completely huge difference and they know that for people with ibs your your gut literally responds to the amount of calories in a meal and the volume of a meal so the, the more that you put in your stomach um, not just more calories but more volume as well the stronger that it triggers what's called the gastrocolic reflex, which is where something hits your stomach and your stomach signals your brain and your brain signals your colon to start contracting. So it's the body's normal way of saying there's food coming in, so something should go out. Yes. But if you have IBS, that gastrocolic reflex goes terribly awry and it just really overreacts, sometimes underreacts to what should be normal stimuli and eating or drinking does not result in the normal peristalsis. It results in violent spasms and cramps and associated diarrhea. It results in mistimed, irregular, uh, too infrequent contractions, which then leads to constipation and often bloating and cramps as well. So it can go to either extreme. The goal with your diet is to 
use those foods to you know, gently, calmly, but uh, enthusiastically force your colon into normal rhythmic contractions, to force that gastrocolic reflex to behave normally. If you can do that, you can a lot of times successfully prevent symptoms. And that's key. It's always easier with IBS to prevent symptoms than to try to stop attacks and get back to normal once they've started. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And anyone who's listening to this interview live, I actually have um, a, a handout. Heather very kindly um, did a very special bonus for Fuel Yourself Fabulous Live viewers. So I'll, with the, and that's got all this information in it, and it actually breaks down when to eat, how to eat sort of soluble fiber foods, insoluble fiber foods. So it, it's just tremendous information. So thank you so much for this, Heather. And, and right. I, I'm networked in a lot of groups online where, where you know, IBS uh, type groups and what happens when someone has an attack? Like, because when people have an attack, it's, you know, they're living off rice and crackers or they just don't eat. But firstly, how do you prevent an attack and what do you do when you have an attack? Oh, yeah, that's a good question. I think the soluble fiber foods are key to preventing an attack. I rely on those quite heavily. It's just a day in, day out way of eating. Your, your gut's always functioning. This is something you really need to manage on a day to day basis. IBS is always there, it's in the background. So you need to try to force your gut to behave normally. Yes. Use your soluble fiber foods as the foundation to all your meals, all your snacks. You may have to add any soluble fiber supplement. That's okay. Just anything extra that you need that helps you out, it's all good. Um, if you have an attack, it varies from person to person, whether that's going to be extreme pain or mild pain, more diarrhea, more bloating and gas, more constipation. The more that you can resolve that and get yourself to a stable point, the easier it's going to be to stay stable. So this is where it really helps people to key their treatment to their symptoms. Um, aside from the gut directly hypnotherapy, and I would say soluble fiber would be included in that. There are really only a handful of things that help all of the symptoms across the full spectrum. So you can use dietary hypnotherapy, you can use soluble fiber for diarrhea, for constipation, for pain and spasms um, coming from those irregular contractions. If your attack is really severe pain, and that's just what makes you absolutely dysfunctional, I recommend peppermint. It's really the best line of attack for stopping pain quickly, for calming down the gut, um, for keeping it calm. Peppermint is actually a smooth muscle relaxant and a painkiller. So you can use enteric coated peppermint oil capsules. You can use high volatile oil peppermint tea. If you're desperate and all you have is something like Altoids peppermints, you can start chewing those. Anything that gets peppermint oil into your system is going to stop the spasms in your bowel, stop the pain, stop the cramping. If bloating is more an issue, bloating and gas, and that tends to be one of the most frustrating symptoms for people. Bloating can be yes. really hard to get on top of. Uh, fennel tea can be tremendous for that. And again, you want high volatile oil, fennel tea, you want something that is medicinal strength, not just a nice cup of tea to drink because you're using this to try to physically affect your IBS, not just something that's pleasant for an afternoon drink, so you need it very strong, very powerful. Um, fennel is a carminative, so it's terrific for helping your body you know, reduce bloating and gas, expel gas. So it's really going to depend on your combination of symptoms, um, what you are focused on. Is it pain, is it diarrhea, is it bloating, is it constipation? And then finding the combination that works for you. And I would certainly add in stress management as something that can work across all symptoms. Um, yoga has pretty good results across all symptoms or meditation. Getting enough sleep makes a big difference for people. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a very big believer in um, weight, weights at the gym as well because it, anything that is a total a mind sport like yoga, like meditation, where you just switch everything else off and you're just concentrating in the uh, you know on the job in hand, I think that's very very good for stress relief and stress busting. Definitely, and actually, exercise in general when you exercise, it's not just your arms and legs; you're working your internal organs and muscles as well, and your entire GI tract is smooth muscle. So it's really helpful just to do some daily type of, of exercise. It doesn't have to be intensely aerobic. 
but the more that you can move around and keep in shape, the less likely you are to have symptoms, the less severe they are to be, definitely. And it also it keeps everything regular as well, the more movement that you have. It does, yeah. You, you definitely, you need muscle tone throughout your body, you know, not just in your limbs, but throughout your bowel as well. So anything that you can do that encourages normal rhythmic contractions of the bowel will help. And anything you can do that will you know, discourage stimuli that spike those contractions, that will help as well. It's really just trying to keep your gut calm, stable, rhythmic. And you've, you've given some really, really valuable sort of pointers around that. And Heather, what's your view on FODMAPs? Where does FODMAPs fit into the overall style of eating and, and sort of to eating with IBS and around your, sort, around your books and plans? Because it's a very, very big area of research at the moment. Yes, it is. It is. Um, it's been really nice to see a lot of attention given to IBS in any subject, it's just lovely to have the attention and the research going into it for a change. Um, I would add on FODMAPs to your foundation. Um, yes. When you, if you're looking into FODMAPs, and it's about 70 to 75% of people with IBS that are helped by that, so there's a chunk of us that it doesn't apply to, um, but it's definitely worth looking into to see if it's going to help you. Yes. It is very much recommended that you do this under the guidance of a dietitian who is familiar with FODMAPs and I would add on a dietitian who is also familiar with IBS um, and the reason for that is that you don't want to exclude all FODMAPs forever from your diet. That is not the point of a FODMAPs diet. And FODMAPs are kind of like insoluble fiber found in what tend to be the healthiest foods in the world. Many fruits and vegetables and beans and grains. Yes. So you definitely don't want to just cut these out of your diet, and you don't need to. The whole point of FODMAPs exclusions for IBS is finding your specific sensitivities, yeah. your specific FODMAPs, and you may have none, you may have one, maybe you have a couple, maybe you are sensitive to all of them, but you need to find that out, and it's a bit of an involved, lengthy process of excluding foods and then adding them back in, paying attention to what you have tolerances for and what you don't. And then again, there's gonna be a degree of intolerance. Yes. You may well be able to do a little bit of polyols. Maybe you're sensitive to fructans, but you can you can tolerate some. Yes. So you need to find those degrees, just as with insoluble fiber, really. Find your degrees of sensitivity and work within them so that you can get as many of these nutritious foods as possible without triggering your symptoms. Yes. So I suggest that people get their diet solid. Learn your soluble fiber foods give you the foundation of gut stability, learn your insoluble fiber, take the trigger foods out of the equation, because whether they have FODMAPs in them or not, coffee is a GI irritant for everybody. Yes. Fat's a GI stimulant for everybody. So, you know, a great big juicy steak, it's FODMAPs free, that doesn't mean it's safe for IBS. Mm -hmm. So get your foundation safe, and then if you need to add in the FODMAPs, do so, but do so carefully. And if yes. you don't feel comfortable doing that on your own with a book or internet guidance, I really urge somebody to find a dietitian to work with. Find your particular FODMAPs exclusion, kind of like icing on the cake. Yeah. So, so you're, what you're saying is work it in conjunction with with sort of um, the the basis of eating for IBS that you, the, the book that you've published. So build FODMAPs in once you've got the basics of how you should eat, when you should eat, how I should. Yeah, because even. You know, foods that are FODMAPs free are not necessarily easy on your gut. Yes. It's one part of the equation, but you know, if you exclude all FODMAPs and you're eating foods that are super high in fat and are GI irritants and proteins that are really hard to digest, you're kind of swimming upstream. There may be some people where that's all they need to do, but it's not the feedback that I'm getting from people. They, they really, they need their foundation. They need to pay attention to the difference in fibers and they need a dietitian who knows IBS as well as FODMAPs because if it's just FODMAPs and then they recommend you know, all these other foods are safe because they don't have FODMAPs, they may still be trouble for IBS. That's that's the hitch. Um, I think dairy is a perfect example of that. Lactose is one of the FODMAPs. But people who are not lactose intolerant and have IBS are still quite likely to get sick from dairy. 
yeah. it's very high fat, casein yeah. and whey are dairy proteins that are very hard to digest. So even if it's lactose free, it can still cause problems. Yeah. Even if you're not lactose intolerant, dairy can still cause IBS to flare. So there is one where I would not even pay attention to the lactose issue of it. I would just eliminate dairy and see how you do. Probably going to have better results. Yeah, actually, it, it's making a lot of sense. And what what would you recommend instead of uh, dairy? What are the what are the things? So many great replacements for that. Um, I would choose what works for you and what you like. If you can tolerate soy, that's a great replacement. There are rice substitutes, almond substitutes, oat. We have hemp substitutes now. Um, there's just uh, huge aisles in the supermarkets now that have non-dairy substitutes. Um, most of them are certified organic. They're all plant-based. Everything from milks to cheeses to ice creams. So read ingredients. Always read ingredients. Um, but you know, try rice milk. Try oat milk. Try almond milk. I like soy milk. I don't have a problem with soy. Some people have trouble with raffinose, the bean sugar in soy. So you know, find what you can tolerate, but really any of them are going to be easier on your gut than dairy. And there's so many now, there's so many flavors. A lot of them are really good. They work very well for cooking. Yes. Very few things that you can't use dairy substitutes for when cooking, that works very well. I tell people to use two egg whites instead of a whole egg when cooking. That's yeah. another good trick. So yeah, anything you can do to minimize your intake of triggers, it's all going to help you. And it's collectively all going to help you to a greater degree. The more things that you can do to keep your gut calm, and to mitigate symptoms, the better off you're going to be. So add in as many different approaches as you need. And just keep adding in whatever combination works for you. That's really what matters. Yeah, I guess that's the key, never never giving up. And a lot, a lot of what you're saying I agree with totally. Because when I switched to eating in a different way, I got rid of the high fat foods. I got rid of the dairy. I got rid of a lot of the wheat products, which um, is an insoluble fiber so you yes, know, whatever yeah. you're saying I'm, I'm in total agreement with Heather yeah it, in a, it, it's true and you know it makes a big difference for, for just about everyone and yeah. uh, what's interesting is sometimes the reasons behind that are different you know it, it might be the insoluble fiber in the bran from wheat that's bothering you and so just whole wheat is a problem you might have a FODMAP sensitivity to the fruit tans and wheat so all wheat is a problem um, you might have a problem with gluten a protein that's in so gluten is a problem. So it, it helps to find out what specifically is it in these foods that's bothering you so that you can exclude as little as possible. Yes. That makes a big difference. It gives you a lot more flexibility and freedom in what you eat as well because I really don't think that people with IBS should be deprived. This is not about living a life of deprivation. It is not about having a diet that is based on deprivation at all. But the thing is, some foods, you know, they may sit with you fine one time you eat them and the next time you eat it the same food is going to cause you problems so so what what's the science behind that heather oh my goodness this is where there's a million shades of gray yeah <laughs> really, and, I, and that's people's biggest frustration i think this yeah. made me sick and then it didn't make me sick is it a trigger is it not i don't know and it really comes down to a lot of different factors um, you know how much of it did you eat because it's not it's like a food allergy where you're allergic to peanuts and you eat a peanut and your throat swells shut and you die. It's not that extreme. You, know, you may be able to tolerate a, a few peanuts. You know, maybe having a, a trigger food like insoluble fiber, when it's cooked, it's tolerable. When it's raw, it's not. It's the same food, but it's having a different effect on your gut. Maybe you ate a handful of popcorn and you did just fine. And the next time you ate popcorn, you were in a movie and you ate the whole entire bucket and now you're very sick. So it can be literally the quantity that you ate. Um, it can be, was your stomach empty? Did you have some soluble fiber foods in your stomach? That really helps buffer your gut's response to other foods. So eating something on an empty stomach versus on a full stomach can make a, a really big difference, um, especially things like fresh fruit or, or raw greens. People with IBS tend to do much better when they don't have a green salad first thing in the meal on an empty stomach. That's the worst time to have it. But maybe if you have a soluble fiber based meal, you can have a small green salad at the end of it and be just fine. It can be the same thing with fresh fruit. On its own, as a snack, when you've got nothing else in your gut, it might really cause problems, especially in large quantities. Maybe you do just fine with it as a dessert. Or if you throw that fruit in the blender and you blend up the insoluble fiber and it's a smoothie now, it might be a lot easier on your gut. So 
it really, it's both a, a gift and a frustration that there is so many variables and so many shades of gray because it makes it frustrating for people to determine what their triggers are when maybe it makes them sick one time but not the next. But the flip side of that is very fortunate in that it gives us a lot more freedom with what we eat. If we can pay attention to how we eat and learn how we tolerate things, why we tolerate things, there's going to be a lot more foods that we can successfully eat and not just have to exclude out of our diets. So everybody's really different and every you, and you've really got to watch, like you said, how we eat, when we eat, the combination of foods. You've really just got to become aware. You've got to become your own scientist, haven't you? You have to you know, learn your guidelines and, and learn your foundations because everybody's going to have the, you know, the same basic biology. Everybody's got the same kind of gut. And if we have IBS, we all have the same thing going wrong with our gut. The symptoms might vary, but the underlying pathology is the same. So learn your soluble fiber safe foods and use those. And then learn your insoluble fiber potential triggers and pay attention when you eat them. How, how do you do these different types of mostly fruits and vegetables and beans and grains? Does it matter if something is cooked versus raw? Does it matter if you eat it on an empty stomach or a full stomach? And maybe there's some foods within there that you just have little to no tolerance for. You just can't do carnivore, you can't do lettuce can't do cabbage or broccoli, whatever it is. Learn those and find alternatives. You know, maybe you do just fine with cooked cauliflower, but not cooked broccoli. Maybe you do well with cooked spinach, but not raw spinach. Just can't do kernel corn, but you can do zucchini and green beans without problem. And you know, maybe you do fine with these foods when they're mixed in with these soluble fibers. So make a fried rice, make a pasta sauce for noodles. Use that soluble fiber foundation to add in your insoluble fiber foods for nutrition and you know always pay attention it, it's much more practical for people to learn their individual tolerances when they have the basic guidelines you don't have to start from scratch there, there are known categories of foods that are going to be likely to help you or hurt you so yeah. learn those categories and what the foods are within them and then start from there to find your individual tolerances it's not as hard as it sounds once you have that foundation of information. And uh, like I was saying before, you prepared very kindly a handout for uh, Fuel Yourself Fabulous TV live viewers, and you actually have listed a lot of foods in there. So, and a lot of them are regular foods that people would be eating every yeah. day, so they can build that into their everyday eating. You don't have to eat weird foods. You don't need to cook separate meals for yourself. There's no reason that you couldn't make something that's perfectly safe for IBS and serve it to everybody else in your family, and they would probably have no idea. They would probably not be able to pinpoint what's the difference between this and just a regular meal. So you shouldn't feel like this is something that is going to restrict your life or certainly not devastate your life, or that you can never eat at restaurants, you can never have a happy holiday family meal, you can never have a special dessert. So that's just not the case. There, there are safe choices and there are safe ways to cook within really every type of, of food category. Fast and easy snacks and meals to all kinds of ethnic foods to traditional family foods. You can modify just about anything to make it safe for IBS if you just understand the foundations of it. And it does help to cook. I think the more that people cook, the more that they know about food and the more that this will make sense to them and they will be able to control their diet successfully. And uh, this kind of eating, again, I'm a really, really big fan of it because when you, when you, um, whether it's FODMAPs or this, you because you're aware of what you're eating, it, it, you, you know, you have to eat more real foods. So you're right. moving away from the whole packaged, processed, yes. you know, yes. shop bought stuff, which yeah. you know has an ingredients list, which I'm totally against anyway. So yeah, it makes you think more about what in, what you're putting in your body, which is going to have a general overall health benefit for you? It will. And read ingredients. That's a that's a really good point. People really need to read ingredients. If you are buying something pre-made, read the ingredients. Even if you've been buying it for years, they might change the ingredients at any point. So keep reading the ingredients. Look at the fat content. See if they're sneaking dairy in there. Uh, manufacturers are starting to add inulin and FOS as really kind of cheap prebiotics to a lot of foods. Um, they cause tremendous bloating and gas, and suddenly in America, they're everywhere. They're in all kinds of yogurts and health food bars and smoothies. And it's 
causing people with IBS some severe problems. So get to know the problem ingredients and read ingredients on everything and ask questions at restaurants. Don't be afraid to ask what's in this or can you make this without dairy? Can you leave the sauce on the side? Can you steam this instead of fry it? So ask, ask questions, <laughs> definitely. And I'm assuming that a lot of these principles um, and uh, there's a lot of recipes in your book as well, Eating for IBS? Yes, it's a good book. Yeah, yeah. I've looked, yeah, it's a very good book. <laughs> it really helps if people cook. That that can be key so that you learn how to prepare foods, what's in different kinds of foods. It helps you across the board to just know what's going to be in things that you are buying that are already prepared or that at restaurants. Having a, a good interest in and knowledge of food can really be invaluable for IBS. And I think that's actually a big part of what let me figure out foods that help me and foods that hurt me. Um, it, it was not just eating, it was cooking that let me figure that out. So that was quite invaluable for me. I've seen feedback from a lot of other people. The more that they cook, the easier this tends to be for them. And um, Heather, we're just um, we need to round up soon, and you've you've actually provided so much useful information. But if there was, um, as this is fuel yourself fabulous TV, if there was one sort of food or one idea that could help people fuel themselves fabulous, what would it be from your point of view? I think it's really important that people with IBS know they're not alone. Yeah, that there's a lot of other people. There's many millions of other people out there with IBS, it is not talked about, um, it's not really publicized, it is the largest chronic health disorder in North America, more people have it than asthma, diabetes, and depression combined. So if you do have IBS, you're not only not alone, there are other people out there who can help you and support you, but there's also a wealth of information and there are a lot of different treatments that you can use from prescription medications to dietary changes to supplements to stress reduction, probiotics, prebiotics. There's, there's this huge, really, arsenal of weapons that we have against IBS now. So please don't feel that you are struggling against an unwinnable war because you're really not. There are a lot of things that you can do to live not just tolerably with IBS, but successfully. And you can definitely be healthy and happy and keep your IBS in control. So that, that is a very realistic goal and expectation for people with IBS to have, and they need to know it is perfectly possible. And if, if you've got any questions, could you please leave them uh, right at the box below the bottom of this page? And as we've got Heather on with us, she's already shared some fantastic information. And um, I'll send out uh, the bonus to everyone that's tuned in. But if you've got any questions, please, could you leave them at the bottom of the page? Heather, I'm just gonna I'm just I'm gonna see if there's any questions from viewers. I've got a question coming in from Mandy from Cambridge and she says um, do we have to eat this way forever is this sort of a lifestyle change the principles in your book is this is this something that we should carry on forever or once we've really managed our symptoms can we start to eat normally and not worry about the principles so much well, it, it probably is a lifestyle change that you are going to have to continue um, there's no real evidence that IBS disappears that underlying pathology is there I would say that the more that you get yourself stable and the longer that you can stay stable the easier it is and I think the more resilience you have against triggers and other upsets for your gut. So you probably will have more freedom and flexibility with your diet and the rest of your life if you 
have gotten yourself stable for a, a long time. But I can't really say that that means that you can then go to McDonald's and have a cheeseburger and fries so the meat is fine. Because if the IBS is still there, and there's no reason that it wouldn't be, you can only abuse your guts so much before you're going to have a bad attack and the symptoms are going to flare again. And I've, I've got to make a point this it's um it's actually quite sad my my parents my mom thinks that I've ruined my stomach through sort of healthy eating and lifestyle change and and um, she doesn't she doesn't you know until I got diagnosed last year they just thought that I'd, I'd ruined my own stomach and now that I've, I've got the diagnosis and networked with so many people and starting to read a lot more about it and I'm realizing that God, rich creamy sauces actually set everyone off. You know, fried foods set everyone off. Um, hey, foods. It's just a spectrum. It, you know, yeah. it just maybe causes minor problems for someone with a normal gut. And if you have IBS, it causes severe problems. Yeah. But it's exactly what you said. Dairy is hard to digest for everyone. Red meat is hard to digest for everyone. Fats are GI stimulants for everyone. Soluble fiber regulates the gut for everyone. We just. You know, it, it's just that you don't have a normal gut if you have IBS. Yeah. So what's going to really cause minor issues for someone with a normal gut can cause severe issues for you. And it just it comes down to what you think is worth it. Is it worth it to have a cup of coffee or not? You know, is it worth it to eat the steak or not? And I, I can't give that answer for other people. I know for me, it, it, it's not worth it. I'm not willing to black out from pain. Mm -hmm. I'm just not. So I'm not going to eat the cheeseburger and soda pop and the french fries because they don't taste good enough to justify the consequences. And I think that there are so many other really wonderful things that I can eat that I like much better um, than junk food, that I would prefer to eat the things I truly love and that don't make me sick. They not only taste better, they make me feel better. So that's the lifestyle that, that I want to continue. And that doesn't mean that I would never want to cheat and have a piece of cheesecake. But, you know, I have to keep that in moderation. I, just, I don't have the flexibility to eat whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want. I guess I could, but I would be sick as a result. So for me, that's not worth it. I would rather eat the way I know I have to, to remain healthy. And that's um, totally so, yeah, individual. I'm in total agreement with you there, Heather. I've got another question coming in from Kathleen from Minnesota, and she says, what's the best supplements, the her herbal, herbal supplements, in your opinion, for managing both spasms and bloating? Spasm and bloating. Um, spasms, anything having to do with spasms, cramps, or pain, I, I would really say peppermint. Um, it is such a powerful, smooth muscle relaxant and painkiller. It can both prevent spasms um, and relieve them once they have started, especially if you relieve them quite quickly. Bloating, I think fennel um, is great for that. They will both cross over. Fennel is a bit of an anti-spasmodic. Uh, peppermint, Will definitely help loading and gas. People with IBS are more likely to have upper GI issues like acid reflux and heartburn, and peppermint can be trouble for those, um, in which case you can stick with just the fennel. That's really going to be helpful for the loading and gas. Um, soluble fiber will also head off the spasms. So a lot of natural treatments kind of cross over into multiple symptoms, um, and key that to your symptoms. You know, if, if she's got pain and spasms and bloating and she tolerates peppermint, doesn't have heartburn, I would use both a soluble fiber supplement and I would use peppermint. If she can't tolerate peppermint, I would use soluble fiber and fennel. So experiment. Find what works best for your symptoms. And the nice thing about the natural supplements is you can pretty much mix and match them however you wish. You're not going to have peppermint interfering with fennel or vice versa. So use, use trial and error there. Key that to your symptoms and find what combination works best for you. And if you can use them as a preventative, that's even better than using them just to relieve symptoms once they start. Try to keep yourself stable. It's easier to do than to recover once you've really gotten hit with symptoms. And there's something really important as well about these supplements. So whether it's peppermint or whether it's um, fennel, it's got to be the, it, they've got to be really good quality. As in, there's a lot of high volatile oils present in them. That's for the herbs and especially the teas. Yes, you want high volatile oil, medicinal strength large leaf for peppermint, whole seed for fennel. Um, it's just going to be so much stronger. Uh, you, know, you, really, you should be able to brew a cup of tea and it should be practically black, especially peppermint. It should be so strong. Um, the 
stronger it is, the more volatile oil that's in it, the more effective it's going to be. So, you know, if you can't get your hands on that and you can only get just a regular box of grocery store tea, I tell people use five tea bags to a cup. Use the whole box if you have to. You've got to get it strong enough that it works. For the soluble fiber, they're starting to put out things like inulin for soluble fiber now. So be really cautious with your soluble fiber supplement. Um, people don't tend to do well with psyllium, which is actually not pure soluble. It's about one third insoluble. Don't get a fiber supplement that has all this other stuff added to it. You don't want artificial sweeteners in there, colors, flavors, citric acid. You don't need or want any of that. You want something that's just soluble, no insoluble, nothing else added. If you can get a prebiotic that slowly ferments, that will up, actively help bloating in gas, but you do not want a prebiotic that ferments rapidly. So again, read your labels. Always read your labels. And, um uh, I've got another question coming in very quickly um, from Sarah from Stratford and what she, how do I control, I go, I switch from um, IBSD to IBSC, how do I control my bouts of diarrhea and then how do I control my bouts of constipation? Soluble fiber supplement, that is, it's really a magic ingredient for IBS. Um, and it is the one thing that will address all symptoms and it regulates the bowel from either extreme. So you need to get a soluble fiber supplement. It covers everything we just talked about with those. You'd start at a low dose twice a day. Soluble fiber only works when it's in your gut, so you need it at least twice a day. You can do three times a day, even better. Um, the fiber is indigestible. Your gut has to get used to an increase in it. So you start at a low dose at least twice a day. You gradually increase that, and you keep gradually increasing your soluble fiber dose until you reach the point where you feel stable and you don't have diarrhea, don't have constipation, you just feel like on a day to day basis you're stable. And that can be maybe 6 to 15 grams of soluble fiber supplement a day for the diarrhea end, all the way up to 30 grams a day for constipation. It tends to take a higher end of the dose, especially people who have had severe, intractable, chronic constipation, especially if they have these laxatives, they tend to end up on the higher end of the dose range, definitely. So if she alternates back and forth, she might end up somewhere like 12 to 18 grams of a soluble fiber supplement a day. And it would maybe take several weeks to gradually get up to that dose. But if she can carefully, gradually work her way up to that, it should really kind of force her bowel into normal motility. It will stop the spasms, it will stop the cramps, it will regulate the water content in the bowel. So it will prevent both diarrhea and constipation. And then you just keep taking it. Just take it every single day to keep your bowel functioning normally. And it's all quite, it'll function at least as And all these products are available through Heather's Tommy Care, correct? Yeah, we do. We have a full product line just for people with IBS, specifically for their needs and special concerns. And that was really the whole point. <laughs> there was nobody paying any attention to us and giving us what we really needed for help. So oh. I very much wanted to try it out. Um, uh, Heather, you've been absolutely amazing. Thank you so much for um, <laughs> appearing. And uh, yeah, anyone who any anyone who um, listened to the interview live, I'll be sending out Heather's special bonus. Um, if if for some reason you don't get it, do leave me a Facebook message. And uh, uh, yeah, look out for my next um, awesome guest. So um, until my next interview it's sabrina khan over and out with fuel self fabulous tv